we'll come now to our third presentation of this session. Uh, I'd like to welcome um, Sebastian Nerdich from the uh, Universität Düsseldorf and uh, Markus Bingenheimer from Temple University. Uh, they will be talking on their paper, Machine Translation and Buddhist Studies, First Results. The floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start for the first 10 minutes and then Markus is going to take over. Uh, so let's see if my screen sharing works. Okay, I hope you can all see my slides. This looks good. Okay, great. Yes, um, yes. So this is actually a little bit on short notice. Um, just uh, this week, we um, got the invitation to present here. So it's all really um, work in progress, and uh, we hope to maybe be able to publish uh, on this topic um, by the end of this year. Yeah, it's about the lingua dharma translation uh, model for Buddhist languages that we have been working on for the last months. And uh, this is basically, um, yeah, basically a language model that is able to translate Buddhist languages into English. This is our current goal. And um, the basic architecture for this model that we have been working on in the past weeks is uh, the MBAT um, architecture, which is a decoder encoder that is um, pre-trained on large corpora and uh, is actually suitable for sequence to sequence application tasks. And uh, this model has shown strong performance on low resource languages. And uh, it can be trained for translation tasks of more than one language simultaneously. So we can take data from Tibetan, from Chinese and from Pali and Sanskrit eventually even at the same time and train the model jointly. So it's able to translate into English. And um, our assumption here is that transfer learning from modern Chinese uh, to English can also benefit the Buddhist Chinese to English learning process. And I think uh, modern Chinese uh, to English is probably the only language pair that is really going to have a direct positive effect on the training. Because um, for Tibetan, it's unfortunate that uh, Tibetan language is usually not included in even the largest language models like XLM, Roberta, which has more than 100 languages. That's very nice. But for some reason, Tibetan is never among them. I hope this will change in the future. But those pre-trained models usually don't include it. And of course, for Sanskrit, it's um, until recently, it's the similar situation. Uh, so our biggest hope here is that in the case of Chinese, we might make the quickest progress because we can use the transfer learning from modern Chinese to English. Um, we have also made experiments with randomly initialized transformer models. Uh, this is something I have always been again and again looking into for the last years. Um, if we can use them for the training of our languages, but so far, with the exception of Pali, it never really worked out. And I will talk later about why it might work better for Pali than for other languages. Uh, the model MT5 is also something that we tried. Um, it's able to converge, but the performance is not as good as MBAT. So among those that we tried out, uh, MBAT was most convincing. Um, yeah, coming to the data situation, um, as you might can imagine, it's not great um, because uh, these are small, uh, comparatively uh, under-resourced languages, uh, which uh, don't receive as much attention as, as modern languages for which we have large parallel data corpora like English and French or English and Chinese. So whatever we can get here is already uh, extremely helpful. And the situation is probably best for Pali, I would say, because uh, most of the, canonical material is in good edition and um, they have also been very actively translated in the 19th and 20th century so partly we really have a lot of, of of training data and also the translation are constantly being improved there are people who um, retranslate the text every couple of years and we really have pretty good translations of uh, a, a good amount of the Pali canon available and especially for this uh, canonical sutta literature which is um, said to hold the word of the Buddha, one could say this. Um, the situation is really good because the language here is very repetitive. It's not varying so much from text to text. There's a, a lot of similar sentence structures and so on. So 90,000 uh, sentence pairs in this case really bring us very far. Um, the situation of the commentaries is much worse um, because we don't really have any clear uh, good training data for this yet. 
We try to accumulate this and I hope that we will make progress in the future, but it's uh, still limited at the moment. Uh, turning now to the situation of Tibetan, um, we have about 62,000 high quality sentence pairs from the Kangyo domain, um, which have been taken from the translation memory of the uh, 84,000 translation project. And this is really a good start. Um, and it's already um, something that can be used to train language models that are then um, useful for uh, acquiring more parallel data, for example, sentence alignment and so on can all be done based on this data. Um, but of course, for Tibetan, there's much more data out there, which is still in some um, translation books uh, that need to be um, OCR and then sentence aligned in order to be useful for our training here. And um, especially the scholastic Tibetan material from the Tengyu, we don't have any training data at the moment, but I assume that it's rather easy to um, collect this because there are quite some texts which have been com uh, translated completely. So um, I think we can make progress here um, relatively cheaply, I would say. Now coming to the Chinese, um, what we now have at hand is about 140,000 automatically aligned sentence pairs, um, which are ranging from the Agamas, which is basically the word of the Buddha in Chinese translation, um, very similar to what we have in the Pali Canon. Uh, and then the Mahayana Sutras, which is um, also from the, I, I would say from the complexity of the language, maybe more on the side of the Agamas, more simple repetitive uh, structures. And, but then we also have uh, scholastic works from the Yogacara and Abhidharma domain and Madhyamika and uh, even tantric works. Uh, so it really becomes more and more complex, not to speak about all the, um, the material that has developed in China itself and in Japan later. So. Uh, that really becomes uh, very complex. And as we can see, I would guess that maybe the um, linguistic range um, of the register of Chinese is among these languages, probably the biggest for Tibetan can also be, um, might also have a strong variety. Um, so while we have 140,000 sentence pairs, um, they are basically just a drop in the ocean, one could say, because they only cover this a little bit and that a little bit and that a little bit. Uh, and still we have uh, a lot of ground to cover in order to really um, get, uh, get a solid data set. And I would guess that in the case of Chinese, maybe we have now uh, digitalized about 10% of what I think might be out there. Um, of the translated data. So there's still a lot of room for improvement. Yeah. Um, regarding the model training, so just to give some figures, for Pali, um, we reach about 22 blue. Uh, Marcus will later talk a bit uh, about what these uh, scores mean uh, for canonical Sutta translation. So this is really nice. And we already got feedback from the community who um, are very happy to use this translation in downstream tasks. So this is really something that you can present to a an user and they will be very happy to use it because it's really a solid quality. For the Tibetan, um, when we stay within the Kangyo domain, uh, we get something between 18 and 20 blue, which is not bad, I would say. It's um, uh, already something that can assist a translator and um, maybe make the translation process faster than um, if doing it all from scratch by hand. Um, but as soon as we leave the Kangyo domain, um, performance is very problematic. So I cannot advise this model to be used for Tengyo translations. Um, for this, we have to wait until we have enough training data on that end. Uh, for the Chinese, um, the situation is clearly that the performance varies um, really uh, depending on the domain. So for Agama and Mahayana Sutras, we get something between 12 and 15 blue. And from my own impression, I would say there are really longer stretches of these texts that are actually quite usable in the translation. So uh, it really works out well at times, sometimes not so well. Um, but if we turn to scholastic works, uh, Abhidharma text, uh, Yogacara text, we drop clearly below 10 blue. And this is also, I would say, not yet at the point where we could really offer this to users and um, expect them to make good use out of it. I think it's still not there. It's slowly getting there, but uh, for scholastic texts, we still have a lot of problems. And um, yeah, coming to the bottlenecks of the model that we have at the moment, um, the first and obvious bottleneck is that the MBART model has been pre-trained pre on English and Chinese uh, among many other languages, uh, but among our languages that we need for this process, it has been only English and Chinese. 
so we still want to train this model to include also Tibetan and also the special domain of Buddhist Chinese, which uh, to my best knowledge has not been used uh, for the pre-training of the official MBAT model. Uh, and of course, Sanskrit and Pali data, we would also like to include this for the pre-training of the MBAT model. And then training data, of course, obviously, um, for both Tibetan and Chinese, only a small fraction of the available translated works are currently available as sentence aligned training data. So there's a lot of improvement that we can make here. And um, yeah, another thing that is very important uh, is context, because uh, scholastic material in um, Buddhist text, I would say independently of the language, it's the same problem for Tibetan as for Chinese as for Sanskrit, um, that uh, we need a lot of contextual information for precise translation, because uh, sometimes there are uh, verses, karikas, which uh, are referring, uh, which need the following commentary in order to be understood, because if you only see the verse, it's impossible to make sense out of them without uh, knowing the following commentary, for example. And in order to have a translation model that is able to deal with this problem, we need a lot of more context than what the current models are giving us. So, but uh, this is something we uh, need to work on. Yeah, as I mentioned, especially difficult is the interplay between verses and their respective commentaries. Uh, conclusion, yeah, coming to the conclusion of the model training, um, I would say machine translation of ancient Buddhist text is either comparatively easy if we are talking about sutra uh, and uh, sutra material, or it is actually very, very hard um, if we look at later verses and scholastic material. And it seems from my impression, there's not that much material that is in the middle ground. So either we have uh, things that work very well uh, and we have parts which are really challenging. Um, a lot of progress can be made by properly digitizing the already translated material for Tibetan, Chinese, and Sanskrit. Um, proper pre-training reduces the necessity of sentence-aligned training data. So we expect that by proper pre-training on in-domain data, we will uh, see a significant performance boost, uh, which we want to do this summer. Yes. and. Finally, language models that are trained with a big sequence length, at least 512 tokens or more, are promising candidates to solve the problem of context awareness. So the window of context uh, needs to be at least big enough that uh, a first and its corresponding uh, commentary can more or less fit into one, uh, one uh, sequence. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. This is for my part. I now hand over to um, Markus. All right, can you hear me? Can you see my screen? Yes, wonderful. Okay, great. So to put Sebastian's report in context in Buddhist studies, we are all pretty slow readers. So we go over a text and then we slowly compare um, Sanskrit with the Chinese and with the Pali versions and with the Tibetan versions. And the problem now is um, Sebastian and a company called DeepL in, in Germany, they have produced a whole translation of the all of the Chinese Buddhist canon, okay? And so you get a folder and you say, okay, here is your Chinese Buddhist canon now in English. Isn't that fantastic? Um, the problem that the scholarly community has with that is that we have no idea about how to evaluate that. We open the files and we see translations, which are obviously not done by a human translator, they're done by a machine, so they're full of mistakes. The question now is how do you assess different types of machine translations against each other? So in a few years, we will have a dozen or a couple of dozen of full translations of any canonical edition. And I think this is relevant to those of you who work in other uh, languages as well, because this is not going to go away. So machine translation is going to move ahead into low resource languages and then the question now we have to as a scholarly community we have to learn how, what to make of those so what quality measure would allow us to compare different machine translations right and that's related but slightly different to the question of how to evaluate different language models so we are talking about the output of those models now models have their own issues. I mean, there's about size and speed and so on. Um, you are getting a folder with 5,000 
translations in it, and you have to find a way to um, uh, assess that somehow. This is actually a very strongly debated topic in, in research. Someone has called it the cottage industry for automatic of um, uh, automatic evaluation metrics. So within machine translation, this is actually a constantly um, uh, debated topics of how do we evaluate the output of machine translation. The developments in machine translation architecture itself has impacted these metrics because machine translation has been attempted machine translations have been around since the 1960s right and then it was a very very slow development until the 1990s and then things slowly got better and of course in the last six years or so immense uh, progress has been made by using neural machine translation models. So in 2016, those of you who, who remember using Google Machine Translate, at one point in 2017, there was a big jump in performance in Google Machine Translation. And this is because the underlying architecture was changed to this neural machine translation um, models. And for example, one of the side effects is that in older evaluation metrics, um, people would often evaluate adequacy, that is something like accuracy of the translation, next to fluency. Um, but fluency with neural machine translation architectures, fluency is much less of a problem today. So all the sentences that are outputted by machine translators today read like a decent, say, English language sentence, right? But the problem is now basically comes, is basically comes down to the accuracy. Does the um, sentence in the target language, say, say English, um, accurately reflect the, the original in Chinese, Sanskrit, Pali, whatnot? The main venue where these metrics of evaluation are discussed is the so-called workshop for machine translation. And very generally, there are two ways of assessing these machine translations. One is human in the loop, right? You have a human, um, you, you, you show the translations to 20 humans and each of them does 100 um, sentences and they just say yes or no, this is correct, this is not correct, right? And then you collect data, you sample it and then you say, well, this is what um, uh, happens. One of the problems with that, uh, Sebastian already um, said, is that the performance of our model so far across our corpus is very uneven, right? So it very much depends on um, what kind of um, text you ask the human to, to, to sample, or perhaps we can find some more intelligent sampling techniques. Humans can also grade um, or rank machine translation output and the one very intelligent measure that is often used is the translation edit rate. So basically there's a machine translation output, the human corrects that by post editing. And then there is an automatic comparison between the machine translation and the post edited version and the one with the least editing steps wins. Okay, so that's sort of uh, different models than can come up um, with a better result if we need fewer editing steps to debug those machine translation outputs, all right? Um, human assessment is also slow, it is expensive, and it's very hard to tune, so you can hardly make, make changes. And um, this is what leads us to consider, first of all, automatic metrics. Automatic metrics is you get the output from your model. You have a 5,000 Chinese text now in English, um, and then you run a metric against that, and then you get, you get back um, uh, um, um, a figure, say the blue, the blue, uh, uh, a blue um, score. Um, you need also human reference translations for that. So you have the machine translation output. The strategy of all these different automatic metrics is the same. You get a machine translation output, and that is in some fashion compared to a human reference translation of the text. So you need first humans like um, what uh, uh, um, Tia called uh, the ground truth. So you need, um, you need a human made um, sample for the 
machine to to uh, to sort of check against. Um, and the most famous metric that is used most widely is is uh, what is what is uh, mostly pronounced blue. But of course, it's from the French bleu, and. Uh, there are others like Meteor and Tur. I'm not going to go into the details now to leave more time for question. Um, they, they, there are lots and lots of these automatic metrics and I'm looking forward to try all of them on our uh, productions. But um, because though those are relatively cheaply to implement, uh, may, uh, relatively cheap to implement, um, they, they can run quick. The problem is what do they say? When Sebastian said, well, with Pali, we have a blue score of 22 or so. The 22 in itself does not mean very much, right? The problem is that none of these numbers are intuitively pointing to something. It's not like it's percentage of, of correct sentences or anything, right? So it's not like it doesn't work like that. So in order to get to, for it to mean something, it must be compared to other uh, outputs, preferably of the same corpus. So you can't even compare the blue score for something that translates Pali with the blue score from something that translates German into an other from another corpus. So it really must be, um, it really is, we have to produce more different um, uh, uh, iterations of our models. We have to train our models more comprehensively. And then with things like the blue score or meteor or tur, so we could, we can then sketch um, a progression if that is the case, if that happens. And then we would have to prove that the human impression of those translation improvements actually correlates with our automatic metrics. And then, then we have a paper. Then we are good, right? Then we then we can publish that. So. Um, these these metrics can go totally wrong sometimes for a variety of reasons and they have to be somehow um, brought to correlate with the human assessment of of the translation output now as for our project now lingua darme um, first now we want to compare the output of the two models that have has have produced a full translation of the chinese buddhist canon so far right um, and we also want to keep doing that in the future. And we will do we will do this first using automatic metrics because we don't have the money and the funding to to hire a mechanical Turk for for and and it's also very difficult for these kind of texts to actually outsource that into the crowd. So it, it would have to be done by by experts. What we do now is we create the human reference translation data that will help us to apply those automatic metrics on on our on our outputs. Um, to give you some examples of how this, how this looks like, what the situation is right now, those of you who, who read Chinese, they say, um, uh, And the deeper translation, so one, one of the automatic translations says, Kashyapa Buddha has a disciple in charge named Shotoku. And then Lingue Dharma translates, Kashyapa Buddha had an attendant disciple named Sunetra. Both are wrong. So both render this shanyo in Chinese wrongly. Both sentences read like a perfect English sentence. So there's no way from the English to somehow notice that there is something off here. Um, uh, it is purely, you have to be able to identify from the uh, Chinese translation of the Sanskrit name, what's going on here. And indeed, this is one of the things that probably is unsolvable for a um, machine translation because it, we know from lists and other material and other research that the name of Kashyapa's Buddha attendance is Sarvamitra. But this particular Chinese here does not really translate Sarvamitra in Sanskrit. So it's not a representation of what you would expect here. It's something that you can only solve with a footnote effectively. Um, on the other hand, sometimes you have you have um, sentences which are translated correctly by both models, which is an incredible breakthrough. I don't know whether um, you are excited about these things, but for me, um, as an as an approaching senior citizen, it's like 20 years ago. This was like totally science fiction. Okay, you could not have imagined that a machine would um, render this sentence here. Um, 
correctly into English, okay? People would have would have would have laughed you out of the room, and now it's happening. This is why this is why we are doing this. Um, uh, the problem with context that Sebastian mentioned is really very important. So the the issue is here. Here is a string of Chinese characters, and they are marked and they are separated, as you can see, by by full stops, right? So the machines try tend to translate every sentence as its own segment. The problem is, of course, like in other languages, sentences run together, right? You, you have the same subject, for example, that carries over into other sentences. And this is what our models do not do very well. So on ordinary days, you, subject, mustn't do evil. And then it changed, the subject changes in they consecrate themselves to the practice of goodness. And then every day he is mindful. So from you to they to he, right? The correct solution would be something as an exhortation to the reader in something. In everyday life, one should not commit evil, practice all that is good, and always keep the pure land of the West in one's mind. So, right? It's like it's speaking to the speaking to the reader. And in our uh, machine translations, the subject sort of jumps around. And that is needs to be fixed. And that's that's a research question for for the next couple of years, really. Right. Okay, I'll, I will stop here to leave a little time for for questions. Yes, thank you for uh, that exciting presentation. Let's uh, take about five minutes um, for questions related uh, just to this presentation. Um, if there's someone who wants to ask one, otherwise a few have already come in the chat. If I can get my chat window to open again. Yes, uh, so I'll, I'll start with the chat. Two questions came in there. Um, how does the OCR of, of Tibetan text work? And how does one double check the results? So one question that came in. And maybe I will take that. Yeah, currently when I talked about OCR in the presentation, it was not so much about the OCR of our um, source languages, uh, Chinese, Tibetan, uh, Pali, or Sanskrit, because for those texts, actually the canonical material that we are addressing first uh, is already digitalized sufficiently. But um, this was more about the OCR of the English translations. And um, this is actually also not always easy because we have a lot of mixture of um, English and the respective source language. So, so maybe there are some Chinese characters in between or Sanskrit uh, terminology and so on. And this is actually for the OCR still a problem. So when we get the OCR data out for the sentence alignment, it's actually noisy and we need to improve the methods on how to clean this data. So this is still something which uh, needs to be addressed. Yeah. Um, uh, John Armstrong, you've raised your hand. You'd like to ask a question? I'm not hearing response. Um, so I'll go to the other question in the chat. Um, what is the script type of the source language for Pali and Sanskrit? Um, example, are you translating between like um, Tocharian to English or um, Karashti to English, or is it uh, Devanagari to English? Well, scripts are not languages. Mm -hmm. So the script does not matter at all, right? All of the things we do are, if it's not in, if it's not in Chinese, it's usually romanized. Yes. All these languages are usually romanized. I think it wouldn't really make a difference if we use Devanagari or Roman transliteration, just out of convenience, because for programming reasons, it's usually a little bit easier to use Roman transliteration because you have less of a, of a hassle with all those uh, Unicode problems. But generally speaking, we could use Devanagari or any other script as well. It would turn out uh, similar, I think. OK, uh, yes, uh, John Armstrong. You I'd like to ask a question? Yeah. Yes. yes. Now, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Um, I read about first read about this project on your Facebook announcement. It was put up several weeks ago, and I was really I come from a software development background. I was very impressed by the overall scope, long term goals, and the possibility of collaboration of different teams on the project. But to get down to a more specific question, is is it possible to create a ground truth to test systems? That is not that that can filter out, say, the fluency, the style of the translation, and is more interested, more interesting, more interested in the mapping of, say, lexical items or semantic content from the source to the translation. So, 
That's my question. I think the role of dictionaries, we still are struggling with that. Is that correct, Sebastian? I mean, we still need to find, we have very good, we have in, in Buddhist studies, there's a very, very good lexicographic tradition, mm. which you need to map these, let's say Chinese or Tibetan transliterations to the Sanskrit original. Mm. Okay. And that we are trying to utilize that. We're not quite there yet technically to, I mean, the idea is you have to weigh the the input weights, right, for these for these words as they appear mm -hmm. with the help of these dictionaries. And that's still a little bit I think next year's project or so. I, would you agree, Sebastian? Yes, I think um, I have generally speaking two uh, ideas on how this can be fixed. The one is, of course, to augment the data uh, by um, taking sentences where we know the subject and the object, and then we just replace the vocabulary with things that are not frequently seen in the in the uh, data that is available to us, so that it becomes more robust. Uh, because currently, it's really as as the uh, the examples demonstrated by Marcus show, we don't have control about our vocabulary as much as we would like to. And this is something that in deep learning, I always find it very frustrating because you want the model to do something, but it's usually not doing what you want it to do. <laughs> it's uh, doing something which uh, is more or less similar to what you wanted it to do, and then you need to find ways on how to fix it. Uh, so yeah, I think um, data augmentation is one strategy, and one can also use named entity recognition on the output and then see if there's some way on um, and forcing dictionary constraints on that level is. Okay, that I think addresses a little bit a question that came in the chat as well. Um, someone commented, I'm completely ignorant with regard to MT, but can you make use of existing lexical data, e.g. TLS, DDB, to train the machine? I think that is a bit of what's going on, yes. Um, I'd like to, um, we can still ask questions to this uh, paper, but we can also, we should open the floor now as well to questions that may still be open from the other papers. Um, let's see. Any questions? Otherwise, I have a bit of uh, one for the Buddhist texts. Uh, so you keep talking about the different texts and um, the translations kind of into English, but how how consistent are these texts with each other? So I, I come from biblical studies, and mm -hmm. so you have pretty depending on what text you're dealing with within the Hebrew Bible, right? The Greek version of that can look substantially different, and the Latin can look substantially different from each of those as well. Um, and so I was wondering, is there how much can you really um, set standard equivalents and things like this um, in in your canon, or does that even play a role? Is that is that significant? In, in the canon, there are two types of texts, both in the Tibetan and in the Chinese, and also in the Pali, really. But not, not, Pali, is a, Pali, for several reasons, is a little bit of a special case. But Tibetan mm -hmm. and Chinese are comparable in that the canons that we're trying to, the canonical editions that we're trying to render into English, both have texts which are translations from Indian originals. Mm -hmm. And they have a lot of texts which are productions by Chinese, writing Chinese for Chinese and audience and Tibetan by Tibetans for Tibetan audience. So those are often very different worlds. This is what Sebastian said. Well, there is the sutra type of literature which are translated from Indian originals. And then there is this other stuff which is much more difficult to get a hold on. And as far as the Indian translations are concerned, yes, there are substantial difficult differences and they're difficult, but yeah, it's, it's um. Uh, it's a that's a very complex question. It's okay. pretty yeah. it's it's pretty endless. But um, um, <laughs> the, there are few texts, interestingly, which exist in all Sanskrit, Chinese, and Tibetan. So there is it's rare to get a a, a, um, a triangle of those texts. There are a lot of texts for which we have Pali Chinese parallels, Sanskrit Chinese parallels, and we have Sanskrit Tibetan parallels. But there are very few that exist in. Okay. In all. Yeah, now I was wasn't sure if there's an issue of daughter translations as well, so that someone translates from the Tibetan into Mongolian um, instead of translating from Pali into, yeah. into Mongolian. Totally, yeah, but 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 we haven't we haven't we haven't started with Mongolian quite yet. <laughs> <laughs> the lack of there's a letter, lack of um, Romanized material in, in digital form. For okay. Mongolian. Yeah. Okay. Uh, are there other questions to the other papers, or to this paper? I have a question for Sukman. Um, 
project for the project and and yeah your your um document model looks a little bit like tei but you decided not to use tei i wonder why that is i thought that tei would be a good baseline standard for a project like that but why not tei um actually uh, i did not decide this because we uh, in our team there was a member who was very familiar to XML and uh, he decided this and but your question is very good I will remember this question and to talk to discuss with our team members because if you want to in the end you want to make this public right you want to distribute your yes. your digitization yes. efforts and also your training data and for that you need a international standard of sorts right so yes. what I, from what i've seen is most of your tags are tei tags but then you don't have the header and in the header you could for example put who did what and 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 where this stuff comes from and so on so it might uh, be, it might be worth it give it a shot thank you for your, your very nice suggestion and yes ti is a better option for this kind of stuff and i i we still have the we still have time to uh improve our data thank you for your advice uh, i also had um a couple of questions about the um the chinese periodicals um paper um the it came up with the question of the rotated characters which i found was fascinating and how to code so that whenever people read the edition they'll also know that these characters have been rotated um i was wondering at the same time um when you have the variants um where you have uh, the different writings uh of a character that have the same meaning right uh, are those tagged in some way so that when uh, I, as a user, am searching for a particular term that I can also see that this has been used in a different way? Is there going to be a way to resolve that issue? Um, do you understand the, the question? So if there's more than one way to write um, true, um, and it, it's, uh, if I'm understanding, I don't know Chinese. Yes. So if, yes. I, if I understand, it's pronounced the same way and used the same way, essentially used interchangeably, but written two different ways. Um, so is there a way that this is also connected? Yes, uh, yeah. both? correctly, yeah. Uh, in the user interface, we want to uh, make them interchangeable. So if you, for example, uh, search for any one of the variants, you can get all the results. Yes, but uh, um, how we can um, show the, to the readers uh, how many variants there are is a problem we have not decided. But basically, uh, by, by now we have a table of the all the ET to the variants in the GitHub. So maybe I can share with you. Mm -hmm. I think this also is very useful. Yes. So if you go into this uh, website and you can click on wiki yeah so this is the home page of our repo echo and you if you click on wiki and find the 0782 the variants you can find what we have concluded uh the different glyphs different code points of each character i hope this will be helpful to to you <clears throat> yeah uh, i mean i'm just interested in the in the theory behind it about how this uh usability is going to be there um a related question uh i'm sure there are typographical errors where there's nonsense um do you correct those or do you make a suggestion for what you think the reading is in cases like that um we yeah we also correct them as far as we can, because some characters are too complicated or too uh, unreadable. But as far as we can, we will uh, mark them as um, as a comment or a, a remark, like, like this character should be written like what, or this character is actually what, but mistaken as what, like that. Yeah. 
And so in, even in cases where the reading is so unclear, you may offer conjectures. Yeah, we will offer our suggestions, uh, which character it might be okay. for the readers. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we have another question from Rifan um, uh, Yeah, Thank you. Just, I mean, it's, I know it's a very naive question, but uh, um, in regards to the Unicode code points, so in case we're dealing with a character that does not have a, you know, an equivalent or does not have a code point, why is it that we cannot just create another one? Why is it uh, limited and why, uh, you know, is this something that has been created at one point and is unchangeable or could it be become a more open system? Mm -hmm. uh, it's also a very complex question. The Unicode uh, code point for the CJK, the Chinese Japanese Korean block, uh, was originally very small, but they are getting larger and larger these years. And the uh, newest version is in 2017, maybe. Uh, now we have the CJK extension block G like that, and we now have uh, improved a lot. Uh, we have a lot of characters in the Unicode, but still. Uh, many real, very real characters are missing. And I think there are uh, some Unicode commu communities. We can, maybe we can make suggestions to them and to uh, make it better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, another question came in the chat for you. Um, uh, can we use IDS um, of CISE project for non-existing characters in Unicode? That came from So uh, Miyagawa. What is CISE project? I, I put the link on the chat. Uh, it is a kind of a um, yeah project for um, for you know describing the structure of the um, non Chinese characters which uh, which do not exist in the Unicode, but um, also all the characters, for example, they are. Yeah, coding encoding the components of the characters, and it's more. Um, it, it covers almost all the Chinese characters. So yeah, it's it has more. You know, um, um, yeah, items in the more more than Unicode. Mm -hmm. Yes, we actually apply the IDS description methods for many uh, real characters in our uh, branches editing. But uh, we have not used these for machine learning. Mm -hmm. I see, yeah. Yeah, Unicode is yeah, much useful, yeah. It, it, useful for machine learning. You, you, you tell the readers the idea description of the characters, but not to tell the machine. I, I see, I see, yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you. So another question came in um, for Sebastian and Marcos. Um, how do you deal with copyright issues regarding existing translations? Do you simply ask for the authorization to use them? Concerning translations that are not aligned with their original text, for example, through um, TEI, are you planning to do this yourself in order to input more data? Hmm. Yeah, maybe I can say something about this. So uh, regarding copyright issues, so far we have focused on works which are available publicly anyway, for example, the BDK translations, um, because uh, this is a substantial corpus and uh, they are available online. And I think it's um, more or less okay to scrape them uh, for the training of a model. I think that is uh, something that is permissible. Um, Regarding the alignment process, um, this we do with an automatic alignment algorithm that is based on sentence similarity metrics. Um, basically, it uh, tries to find an optimal matching between a, a text and uh, the sentences in text A and text B. And for this, we don't need to go sentence by sentence and do that by hand, but it's actually automatically taking entire text and just uh, finding the corresponding parts. Of course, it does mistakes at times, but the machine learning algorithms are usually quite robust when it comes to smaller mistakes. So the majority of the sentences in this way is aligned correctly. So we don't have to do that by hand yet. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from John Armstrong. Uh, yes, this is a question. I mean, these are such fascinating talks. 
a question on the, on the Chinese newspaper project. The process of creating the, uh, the ground truth seemed, seemed, as I understood it, maybe I missed something, seemed extremely labor intensive to me. And I think some of it has to be kind of the detail work, but I just wondered how far you have or are considering doing kind of bootstrapping your creation of ground truth for further training by using your existing, uh, uh, your existing uh, uh, recognition software. Um, so actually our project, uh, our uh, ground truth making projects started in 19, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, 19. 2019 and but after after the, that year our uh, funding was stopped and we continued in uh, last year and uh, by now we have only made the grant choose of three months of Jingbao uh, in total like uh, 50 issues right right mm, I think uh, for uh, we have uh, three different months. One month is in 1939, okay. one month is 1930, and another one is 1920. So it's just uh, yeah. starting and uh, we do not have many stuff because yeah, uh, yeah it's really detailed work and uh, we need many fundings and people and we need mm. the people familiar with traditional Chinese and even with the uh, XML to finish this. So it will be very long. And I, our expectations uh, to use this method to apply to all the similar uh, newspapers in the Republican time, uh, it seems uh, it will be done in future. So far, we um, have uh, 80 issues in 1949 and total 40 issues in both 19. 20 and 1930s. So uh, for the number, the database is still not very much, but uh, we still want to uh, use this uh, database to try to uh, build something. And uh, in the future, we hope that um, we can let the machine automatically uh, with uh, some more uh, newspaper in the Republican period. And after the machine reading it and um, also um, is still need some uh, editors or supervisor to uh, proofread it because um, the Chinese characters um, are too uh, are too changeable, and especially in the old version uh, during the Republican period, uh, just like uh, what I have uh, present in my presentation, many um, Chinese characters have different forms. Uh, now, at this moment, uh, we find um, uh, quite a lot of uh, variants, but we, 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 we're very sure that there are still many variants uh, for the uh, old Chinese, particularly the traditional Chinese uh, character version. So um, that's why we still hope that uh, our project can go on and can extend so that we can make our machine reading um, uh, process uh, for the ground truth and for the OCR system that can go further more. Yes, yes. thank you. Yeah, depends on funding. And I also, I have seen the uh, Madalena's question, yes. uh, whether we will open up the project, it, it, it depends on the funding. Uh, and, uh, but if you are interested in this project or uh, the whole ECPO database, you can contact us, uh, contact the project leader, Matthias Arnold, is taking care of the whole project and uh, we are receiving many kind of uh, collaboration, uh, cooperation. Yeah, for example, the Women Magazine collection was uh, co-operated with the Taiwan Academia Sinica together. So yeah, it can work. I was going to make a suggestion when we were training, um, we were trying to train a model to read um, Greek handwriting from ancient manuscripts. Um, and so we developed a simple web tool so that Greek students and teachers could just, it would randomly choose a letter for them from the manuscript and they would just input and then those would all be collated and connected and then we could really bootstrap and get a good positive feedback loop going. Um, 
yes, there's been a request uh, that you um, have the, uh, the person in charge of that, uh, Matthias Arnold, yeah, there you go. Thank you very much for this very interesting session uh, and for the wonderful conversation and um, question and answer that developed. Um, we are going to be taking a longer break now. Uh, we will be back in 55 minutes. So at 4.30 uh, Central European summertime. So it'll be a 55 minute break, um, stand up, stretch. And uh, we hope to see you then um, when we come back. Thank you again for uh, presenting. Thank you again for listening and for participating. Everything was excellent.